Hi everyone and welcome back to a very special career discovery session. After all, I began these meetings to showcase the different inspiring individuals that are located all around us. And who better to talk about their success story than the CEO of the Guardian Media Group herself. Please welcome Annette Thomas, who will speak to us about her career choices, as well as give us some advice on how to succeed in life. So I'm Annette Thomas. Um, I am currently the chief executive of the Guardian Media Group, which is the um, organization that publishes the Guardian newspaper websites and all of their activities around the world. Um, I, um, I originally trained um, as a scientist, so I studied biochemistry and biophysics as an undergraduate, and I went on to get a PhD in neuroscience and cell biology, which doesn't seem an obvious um, place to start to end up in a publishing business, but um, I think you'll see there's lots of reasons why that makes sense. Um, I, at, when I finished my PhD, I was wanted to try to find a, um, a job that would allow me to use my degree, but also my interest in science, but not in the lab. And I, um, I was successful at getting a role as an assistant editor at a um, scientific journal called Nature, which is very well known. It's um, one of the two leading journals in the world and tends to publish the most groundbreaking um, research in all areas, um, life sciences and physical sciences. It publishes things like going back in time, the structure of DNA, um, uh, Dolly the sheep, um, uh, really important research on COVID, all of that. And you often see it reported in the BBC and the Guardian and elsewhere. All of that research is often published in Nature. So I worked there. And to get that role, you needed to have a PhD because the role was about selecting which research to publish, but most importantly, which, which research not to publish. Um, so it was about taking decisions along those lines. And um, what it means is that about 92% of the research that's submitted is not published in Nature because it's not considered of significant enough advance over what happened before. So it's a way you really need to have an advanced PhD in order to, to, to participate in that process around um, certain areas of science, which is what I did. That's where I started. So I didn't take a decision to go into publishing. I took a decision to follow my passion in science. And um, I think that I was perceptive enough in some ways to realize that working in a lab long-term, as much as I like doing the lab work, um, wasn't going to be the career that would best suit me. So I was trying to look for different ways to use that interest and that degree. And that's where I landed. And um, I ended up staying in the company that publishes Nature for nearly 25 years, which is pretty unusual as a first job, uh, but it was a wonderful company. And my job obviously changed a huge amount over those years. I realized that I was interested um, or that I had a passion for um, creating new things and business development. And I was really fascinated about the way that, that what we did worked in a bigger context and um, how you got the information to the readers, um, how did they pay and who paid and what else were they needing that we didn't provide that we could provide that would give us new additional opportunities. And gradually I moved in that direction. And I think I, I've had maybe two or three real pivotal career decision moments. And I think I realized at a certain point that I didn't, I didn't aspire to be the editor in chief of nature, which is an amazing world famous position. Um, and I didn't know what I would wanna do, but I did know that that aspect of being involved in the business was really interesting to me. And so eventually I did become the managing director of nature publishing group. So I, I oversaw the whole business, including the editors, um, and was involved in transforming that business from the old fashioned print magazines to a digital, um, a digital business. And that was really successful. It got much bigger. There were new ways to um, expand the business from a revenue perspective, new skill sets. And so we grew all over the world. Um, and always kind of guided by the brand that was Nature, which is quite an important and very well-respected brand. And so after I did that for 
a few years, um, I had the chance then to become chief executive of the overarching publishing group that owned Nature. So it was much bigger. That was called Macmillan. That was um, about 5,000 people. That was over a billion dollars of, of, of revenue. And that was operating in about 150 countries. So many different businesses, much more complex, but building again off that experience that I originally had when I joined Nature. And, um, and there, a few key kind of experiences that I had around learning how to manage something that was more complicated um, and, and learning about the impact of globalization and how, how you look at what you're doing through a global lens and make more out of the people and resources and textbooks and everything that we were producing if you looked at it globally. So we had a lot of activity in that regard. And that's also when I got interested in data and analytics and software. And we set up a new business in science, but in that area, not in publishing. And that ultimately has become really successful. And we did that by investing in a lot of different startups and bringing them together to create a new business. And after I left Macmillan, we merged it into a much bigger company. Um, uh, and then I, I left that company and um, and then in the last four or five years, I've had some interesting experiences. I went on to be chief executive of a data software and analytics business in science that was actually the main business in that area that the one that I set up with Macmillan was then competing with. So we set up a young, fast moving startup. And then I went to run the older business, but which was obviously very well established with a very well-known brand. And, and modernize that business. And um, we very quickly um, uh, floated that on the New York Stock Exchange a couple of years ago. Um, and so that was a very quick transformation of that group. Um, and after that, um, I took a little break again, and then I decided to come to The Guardian. Um, and the reason I've come to The Guardian is again, it's an amazing brand, and I believe in the mission of The Guardian its commitment to liberal progressive journalism around the world, but it's also at an inflection point in terms of being able to grow and expand its business, which is quite interesting um, uh, because it's committed to giving its content for free. So it's a really uh, creative process about how you make a great business there that can sustain itself. Um, and I really enjoy after many years of having a new set of questions to answer, focused on sort of general news and media and not more the academic space, which is where I'd spent a lot of my previous career. And so I've been there just over a year. Um, uh, I started two weeks before lockdown. So it's been an interesting first year and it's going really well. And I guess my message from all of that, what's constant is that I've always chosen to work for companies that do things that I'm really, uh, that I really admire and that I think have a social purpose, science, education, informing the public with important journalism, um, I think are really important to helping us live better lives. And um, I've been involved in changing businesses. I really like that concept of change and transformation. So that for me has been a steady. And I've always really enjoyed what I'm doing in the moment. So um, I, I didn't have big career five-year plans. There were a couple of times I realized that I needed to make a decision on a path, um, but for the most part, I've just focused on working in places where I, in, I, I respect what they do, um, where I enjoy um, uh, the people that I work with, um, and that there are people who also care about me and how I do. And I think it's really important because they get sidetracked with um, other issues like, what's my title? Um, how much money will I make? Uh, um, what size is my office? Uh, maybe not so much now in the pandemic, but um, those are not unimportant. Don't get me wrong, but it, it doesn't make up for doing a job that you don't like um, with people who you don't respect. So I think that's what I've tried to keep in mind as I've made my choices going along. So of course, on the, in the positions that you are, you become a great part of the company you work for, but to what extent do you think that affects your identity as a person? How much does it change you in your personal life? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Um, 
And I would say that the first company I worked for for nearly 25 years, that was the most true because I was very young when I started, you know, um, sort of 25. And, and so it very much shaped who I was. And then I went on to run one of the main companies and then run the whole company. So I had an enormous influence over time of that place. And um, I really, my identity became very intertwined with that. And I will probably always be known for the work that I did there because it was for a very long period of time. Um, and so when the company started to change and I realized that it wasn't gonna be the place I would continue to stay at, it was a really difficult transition to make um, because I had become so involved in everything and it was involved with me and my life. And, um, and so uh, I think what I learned from that is you can get a lot of joy from that, but it's important to keep some distance and some space for your own personal life. You can go too far in that direction. And it's great to bring the passion to the table with your work, but it's also important to carve out enough time for yourself. So stemming off of that, what do you think is a calling to a person? So that's a very famous phrase, I think, that people use to describe what they're true what their true purpose is in life do you think that is based just on your career choices or also on your personal life or is it very much intertwined i think it's really intertwined i don't think anybody wants to be remembered just for the work that they did i think it's the impact that you have on the world but also importantly the people closest to you mm -hmm. um i think that you can have a purpose which um, it has enormous impact, uh, but maybe on a relatively limited number of people, but those people then go to have impact in other ways. Um, and so your influence is sort of transmitted through them. That's not just direct. So I think that, um, it's such a, it's such a probing question. It's hard to answer in a short, a short period of time, but I, I think that, um, I do think that it's very much intertwined. I am the kind of person that I can't do a work job that I don't really believe in. I couldn't just work for money or for anything else. Um, I need to really believe that what that organization is doing has a purpose in the world that I respect and I wanna be part of and I wanna make better and stronger. I think that is my motivation and my calling in my professional life and um, and in a way it translates into your personal life as well, because the things you spend your time on are also um, uh, activities that have an impact often in a very similar way. I, I think that you only have one authentic self. You can't bring a different person to work than the person that you really are. Some people do, but I, I think it's not, it doesn't allow you to flourish as a leader. You have to be authentic. And could you tell us a few more ideas about what you think a good leader is? I think that a good leader is, um, picking up on, the, on what I was just saying, it is about being authentically you, you know? I think that's really important. Um, and there's a lot of characteristics that people talk about in leadership, but I think authenticity and integrity are the two most important. And integrity is doing what's right, even when nobody's watching. And so integrity is an action word. Yeah, it's not a state of being, it is an action word. You only have integrity when you use integrity or you demonstrate integrity. And I don't think that you can be a good leader if you don't have integrity. I think it's absolutely essential. And if you're not in the first instance, true to yourself, your authentic self, then you can't be a good leader because people will see that. Um, if not right away, then that at some point. So I really think that those, those, um, those characteristics are the foundation upon which any type of you know, um, leadership discussion needs to start. Right. And those are obviously very much rooted in who you are as a person. What about some of the practical skills? What do you think are things that a student should study and take from college and from university 
that they then apply onto their later life? Well, you know, if you look at my experience, I trained as a scientist, which is not obvious that you then go and end up running businesses and companies. But I think the link is, um, you know, when you train as a scientist and when you study in university, kind of no matter what you study, it is about um, being really curious, genuinely curious. Yeah. It's about making hypotheses about problems and then testing your hypothesis and then looking at those results and deciding whether or not um, you believe what you're seeing. That hypothesis, research, test, evaluate, that set of critical thinking skills can be applied in any number of um, work situations and forms the core of what you need in business. Now, there's a lot of other things you need, but you need those critical thinking skills. I, I see where we are today. I think we should be over here in the future. I'm gonna develop a plan to get there. I'm gonna use data to tell me, does this make sense? And then I'm going to start to, to execute on that and put that into, into motion. I think that set of critical thinking skills can be applied in so many different ways. Um, I think that's really important. I would say another really important skill in college to focus on, again, no matter what area of study you're in, is learning how to tell a good story. Yeah, and that's related to what I just said, which is it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. That art of the narrative, particularly of taking complex, dispersed topics, ideas, observations, and putting them into a narrative so that you can get input and feedback from other people so that you can inspire others about what it is you're working on and what you're interested in. So that if you're in a business context, you tell a narrative. If you go to your boss and you're asking for more resource or money to do something, you have to explain, here's where we are. Here's where I'd like to be. Here's how we're going to get there. Can you support me in this? That's just a story. It's all it is, is a story. And since we were little children, we all like hearing a story. So being able to tell your own story, the story about what you're working on at work, the story about where you'd like to be, that narrative skill is really, really an important one. It doesn't need to be written down necessarily. Sometimes it does, but it, it can be verbal, but it is that art of really, um, really getting passionate about where you are and where you wanna go and drawing people in and being able to paint that picture to make it easy for them to say yes, um, or make them excited about joining you on what you're doing. So that's a really important skill set that you can pick up, not just in university, but before that. And obviously you speak of these stories and you say that there are there is an end point, but often that end point is in the future. And I think a lot of people struggle and there is a certain sense of fear in uh, deciding that end point from the beginning, how do you think that fear should be overcome? Um, I would say the third thing is that um, uh, it's about being brave, yeah, and realizing that there's not that many wrong decisions out there. Um, and that whatever decision that you take, whatever endpoint you choose, whatever vision you have, um, there's gonna be somebody who says, I don't believe it, I think it's wrong, or, you know, no, 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 no. I think it's about being really confident um, in your observations and your choices and knowing that you've got the resilience through because there's always going to be people who try and push you off course or don't actively get on board. There's always a different way. There's always a different possibility. But if you've decided that's the one for you or for whatever situation you're in, being resilient enough to continue to pursue it, of course, taking input in and, but, but there are many, 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 many more people in the world that will tell you no, than will tell you yes. So bravery and resilience is really important, whatever endpoint it is you choose. Amazing. Do you have any final advice for the students listening? My final advice would be this. Um, Focus on doing something that you love. 
because you're going to be doing it for many hours of many days and nothing can substitute for doing something that you don't enjoy. I think that's the most important. I would also say, um, seek out mentors in the situations that you're in. Seek out people whose opinions you value, who are prepared to actively support you. And if you don't see that where you are, then you're probably not in the right place. Um, because uh, for you know, young, motivated um, uh, students um, entering work, the world of work, um, there are many, 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 many of us out there that are very happy to mentor and support. And you should seek out situations where you get that because you're too good not to have the benefit of people who have your best interests at heart. Um, you may need to move, you may need to look, but, but do what you love and find places and people that will actively support you because nothing is worse than doing a job you don't like with people who you don't respect and don't care about you. That's not a long-term solution. No matter how much money you think they might pay you or how glamorous you think it might be, it won't last. It's not real. And it's about finding yourself after all, even in your work environment. Exactly, very, very well said. Thank you so much for being You're here. You're welcome. Come back next week when we're going to be talking to a completely different individual in a completely different field. Bye for now.